sneaking and overeating all week and then being rewarded with really crappy processed food. I want to I want to know what it feels like in my body once I've eaten this and I want to be aware of that, right? Because I, because I'm really not because for so many years I ate until I couldn't eat anymore and that's what I thought like okay, now I'm done. Most of you guys won't know that uh one point in my life I was 360 pounds and my relationship with food and how I used food was absolutely terrible. Today I sit down with Ethan Suplee, a guy who was uh, over 500 pounds and his relationship with food and what he did to change his life and get down to a healthy body weight. Today's video is sponsored by Mullingbrush.com, the best motivational clothing brand in the world, where you can now get the Rise and Grind hoodies and the new journals with the link in the description, where 100% of the profits go back into creating this content. This video is very close to me. Speaking to Ethan about this is very, very interesting. If you have had a poor relationship with weight loss or dieting or food, then this is the video for you. Ethan has gone from basically a death sentence to being a healthy body weight. And even for me, I've lost all that weight, but there are still lessons and there are still unhealthy habits that I have. And I've still always progressed in learning and wanting to grow with my weight loss journey and my food um, addiction journey. And uh, this was a great video for me. So here are some great lessons from Ethan Suplee. I'm your host, Jordan Mulligan. Let's jump into the video. For sure, this, the same thing for me was, I, I, could, I can lose weight fast. Yeah. I can't do it in a healthy manner, usually, and because of that, it usually comes back on yeah. at faster than it, you know, it came on. And I think that's a very common thing, especially like, and I, I think it's so odd. It's it's kind of odd, but also our normal. And so our normal, when you put it into any kind of historical context, to me, it seems very odd that for the first time, and you know, I say the first time, but it's really the last 50 years, but for the first time ever, in human history, we have a massive surplus of food. And I know that people starve to death still today. That's largely due to, or maybe even entirely due to political reasons where food is being withheld to certain groups. So if that wasn't the case, really nobody would starve to death today. But in the West, um, we are so wealthy and, and have such an abundance of cheap calories that you see that the entire population is getting obese. Um, and like, you know, if it was 200 years ago, we would all just be kings and we'd be very happy with that, right? While the rest of the world starved, we would be kings. and And we're not really, we're, you have this, obesity occurring um, and and you have simultaneous obesity and malnourishment which is really wild to wrap your head around so he's getting so many calories that he's fat but he's not getting the kind of micronutrients he needs so he's actually sickly because of it you know so there's a lot of weird things in there to take into consideration I think the majority of food that's consumed is highly processed um, calorie dense and uh, nutritionally void or devoid of nutritional value. So we have like, uh, we're eating a lot of uh, food that is, is uh, they're figuring out ways to cram as much sugar and fat basically and as little protein into uh, the average American diet as possible because that's really the cheapest way to feed people. Um, and so, you know, we are getting larger and larger and, uh, and it's getting to be the younger and younger people too. So we have, um, type two, which is, uh, you know, they, they differentiate diabetes. There's juvenile diabetes or type one diabetes, which is, uh, an autoimmune disease. And then there's basically a type of diabetes where you have fed your body um food that really isn't built for your body over a really long period of time and you wear down your body's ability to um basically take the carbohydrates and get them into the cells for use as energy 
Uh, and that forever was only seen in adults or, or older people. And now we have a massive amount of young kids with that because the food they're eating is um, harming them. Before uh, or early days of when you you started finding food, what did what did it look like as a consumer for yourself? Like in, in, in America, like say you went into the shops or you went out to eat, like what, what would that typically look like? Well, I, I mean, I was put on a restrictive diet as a very, very young kid. So at like five years old, I was put on a restrictive diet. And uh, we, I grew up in Los Angeles. And so we were the, you know, the, the vanguard of every fad diet that ev has ever existed, um, basically, you know, sparked or kicked off in Los Angeles. Um, and for the most part, we ate from like the health food stores. And when I was a little kid, the health food stores were like Sikhs, you know, with turbans or who were vegetarians, which there weren't that many vegetarians back then, or uh, people who looked like they were dying from cancer, right? Were the people that shopped at health food stores. And, and then my mom would go in there going like, well, we got to fix Ethan because there's something wrong with him. So if we just feed him this healthy food, but you know, I didn't want to be on a diet when I was five. And so my workaround for this was just like, I would just sneak food and cheat on my diet. Um, and then if my mother and father perceived that I had a successful week of dieting, my treat would be going to the drive through like a McDonald's or something like that and having this really unhealthy meal. So I'm sneaking and overeating all week and then being rewarded with really crappy processed food. So, uh, you know, my uh, whole relationship with food from the time I was very young was skewed in that way. Like food was a reward and food was also something to be compulsively overeaten in private because it was being withheld from me in public. It's so funny how the, as a, as a young child, how it shapes you as an adult, your eating habits. I think in our family, one of the biggest things was you finish your plate, yeah. which is, it, it, to me, makes sense. Like, obviously you don't waste food, but as, like when you go to a restaurant and the portions are huge, like I'm not, I, I now will not leave a single drop on that plate because I've been sort of brainwashed into this is the way it's supposed to be. I'm supposed to eat every single thing. Yeah, but I also think that the, the mistake there is that um, when we were young kids, like, hopefully our parents were serving us portions that were appropriate for us that were mostly meals that were cooked at home so that i automatically associate with being healthier it doesn't necessarily mean it is but but so i i get that like i have four kids and like i remember when they were young if i was serving them you know some kind of protein and some vegetables and a starch i'm not just giving them a giant dish of whatever and saying eat until you're full i'm making them a plate of food and serving it to them so the idea there is like yeah you got to eat all this and maybe you know unfortunately i wish i hadn't done this but give them some reward of like a, a sweet thing at the end of dinner if you finish your plate now we and I, i'm sure it was like this to some degree when i was a kid and it was certainly like this when my kids were kids but food is so cheap now that in America, in Europe. And, and you know, we're having this interview like right on the precipice of when there could be a food shortage because of like global catastrophic uh, wars and stuff. Like, so who knows? Maybe a year from now, this will be completely irrelevant because there will be people starving again, right? Like that's possible too, I guess. But as of today, food is basically so inexpensive that you go out to eat and the portions are like astronomically big and so packed with fat and sugar that it's like hard for anybody to process that. Mm. Yeah, I, I agree. I, like, and, and I think that's that's the, where we're at now is that I think it's, it's it's healthy to finish your food. The portion size is the the problem right. because we, with the conditioning you're finishing gigantic portions. Yeah, and if we keep this like don't waste food like i do think a lot of there is a lot of food waste in western culture but if we keep this as our our mantra don't waste food and we have so much abundance of food that's not being shipped to people who are actually starving right which maybe it should be and maybe the people who are blocking it from getting to them should be dealt with who knows 
but like um we're gonna be poisoning ourselves with food you know if, if we keep thinking this way like don't waste food okay well let's do something with our excess food right because we have a lot of it do you remember specifically as a as a child like what, what snacks like a list this is mainly for the edit but like what that would look like um well i i remember going to friends houses and and i would be in awe that friends of mine would have like you know, sugar cereal or soda or anything like that, because we weren't allowed to have that in my house. Snacks were, you know, largely just what my mom got at the health food store. So she would get a brand of, you know, that was the other thing that was not really taken into consideration by her. If you buy a box of cookies from the health food store and they have just as many calories as a box of, you know, brand name uh, cookies, but they're made with like better sugar and this like, if the ca caloric value is the same, you're still going to be overeating if you eat too many cookies, right? It doesn't really matter if the food is quote unquote healthy. So I think that was the, the main problem I had. It's like in my house, we had mostly like quote unquote healthy food, but because it was restricted to me, I would then go and binge eat it out of sight. Um, and, and, you know, uh, all the normal stuff kids ate, crackers, cookies, uh, chicken nuggets, all of that stuff. It was just kind of disguised with this idea of being healthy. Yeah, I, I think that, I, th I think it's better now, but I remember when oh, it's, it's, it, we were just talking about veganism, like, you can have a vegan burger with more calories in it than the lean steak burger or whatever, you know, lean beef burger. Uh, There's this crazy thing now too, like keto is super popular and, and um, you can go to the, to the grocery store and, and there's a brand of ice cream I really like and they have a, a keto version and a low calorie version. And the keto version has as many calories as a regular pint of ice cream. And I, I, I don't understand why anybody would eat this and think that they were doing themselves a service. You know, it's not to the benefit of a restrictive diet. Yeah, a lot of brandings go, like a lot of marketing, a lot of branding. It is, it doesn't make sense. It, it, well, you know, each to their own again, but sure. yeah, of course. But I imagine that if you're, if you're making this determination, like I'm eating in a way in order to lose weight, and you're not losing weight, chances are that, you know, just this moniker of keto or vegan doesn't necessarily mean you're going to lose weight, right? Like that isn't a diet that is designed necessarily for weight loss in the way that it's practiced in the mainstream. Yeah, I, I've been an obese vegan, <laughs> an obese meat eater as well. Like it didn't make much of a difference to me. Yeah. Um, so do you remember when you was a child, what the, I know you said like uh, you were eating those healthy foods and then you would cheat on, on them. Was for me, I remember finding I was always a bit bigger, and that always made me a little bit sad. So then I'd eat. That was my cycle. But like, do you, do you remember what your hook was? Like, my hook was yeah. I mean, there was for sure comfort in food, and there and there and it got to be the point where there was a comfort in the the discomfort of overeating. So the minute that I would. Um, be so full I couldn't eat anymore, so full I had to lay down and like rest, that was when I felt satiated, right? So I, I kind of like trampled all, on all my physical cues of what an appetite is. And, and, and I still have trouble with that. I still have to take a plate of food that's portioned appropriately and go, I wanna, I wanna know what it feels like in my body once I've eaten this and I want to be aware of that right because I, because I'm really not because for so many years I ate until I couldn't eat anymore and that's what I thought like okay now I'm done like another bite and I'm gonna throw up you know there's a great um Monty Python sketch where the guy goes to the buffet and he's eating and he's eating he's getting fatter and fatter and and he eats everything and then the the waiter comes out and says do you want a mint? And he says, no, no, I'm, I'm done. And he says, okay, I'll have a mint. And he eats the mint and explodes, right? Like that was what, for me, that, that spoke to me simply because that was the, the point where I associated with being done eating, right? When I was so full, I literally couldn't eat anymore. 
Thank you so much to Ethan for this video. Um, if I had watched stuff like this, if I had knowledge like this when I was at my worst, I do genuinely believe that I would have been better. Food and my relationship with food has been that it's a crutch. It's not, it's not the, the issue isn't that I don't know this food has loads of calories in it. And that if I eat this food, I'm gonna gain weight. And that if I eat this food, I'm gonna be unhealthy. and I'm gonna be obese. The issue is that I am using the food as a crutch. I'm using the food when I feel upset, emotional, uh, traumatized or grieving, I would use the food to feel better. Food is very reliable, it makes you feel good. It's something you can always rely on. And I think that was where I needed to fix the issue. These are some great lessons by Ethan. Uh, and I think it's an approach where you just need to constantly be looking into this. You need to be not getting obsessed with it, but start to educate yourselves around not just what is healthy food, what is high calorific food, what diet works for you, but think, why am I arriving here at eating more? Is it just because I like the taste of it or is there something deeper? Uh, and the American Glutton podcast that Ethan runs is a fantastic resource for that. So I'm going to link that down below. Today's video was sponsored by MulliganBrothers.com, the best motivational clothing brand in the world, where you can get the Rise and Grind hoodies, the t-shirts, the hardest work in the room hoodies, and also the new journal is in the link in the description. Supporting us there makes all this content possible because all the profits go back into creating this content. Everybody who supported us and everybody who's ordered t-shirts and all that kind of stuff, thank you so much. We are always grateful and shocked that, at the support and the level of support you guys give us. And we're so glad that you find value in the content we provide. Um, and anyone who's followed me on Instagram, thanks for saying hello. I've got lots of content coming out at the moment and uh, I hope you guys are enjoying it. So have a blessed and productive day. Go inspire some change and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.